Tonight, the first human case of avian flu caught in Canada. We have to obviously take this very seriously. A teenager infected in BC, now in hospital, but how did they catch it? Canada's two biggest ports grind to a halt, lockouts in BC and now Montreal. We're losing ten dollars to $15,000 a day in lost sales. The potential economic impact. A Canadian crypto CEO allegedly kidnapped for ransom. Harder for somebody to go to the bank and take out a million dollars. Why criminals are demanding payment in Bitcoin. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. A BC teenager is being treated tonight for what's believed to be the first human case of avian flu acquired in Canada. Work is now underway to figure out how they caught it. Avian flu is usually found in birds like poultry, and BC health officials say that's likely the source of exposure in this case. It is important to note the virus jumping to humans is rare. Yvette Brand explains what we know about this case. Canada has what's believed to be its first human case of avian flu, caught by a teenager in BC's Fraser Valley. What isn't known is how the young person got infected. We have to obviously take this very seriously. The teen is being treated at BC Children's Hospital while public health workers follow up with their contacts. Provincial Health Officer Bonnie Henry says they're conducting a thorough investigation to fully understand the source of exposure here in BC. Health officials say the likely source is an infected animal or bird. There's no indication of any human cases associated with a BC farm at this time. 6.4 million birds have been infected on BC farms and there have been outbreaks on American farms including in nearby Washington state. We moved to our highest level of biosecurity on, on October the 16th when we were seeing other cases uh, in neighbouring jurisdictions. Migrating birds drive the spread with what they leave behind. We know this is circulating globally in uh, obviously in, in wild birds and there's of course this very large outbreak. We know that uh, political borders don't stop the spread of infectious diseases. While human cases of avian flu are rare, more than 40 have been detected in the U.S. this year. Most have been on the milder end of the spectrum, uh, but we know that this is a virus that has uh, potential to cause significant clinical harms. In 2014, a Canadian resident died after likely being infected in China. There is no vaccine for avian flu, but experts say a seasonal flu shot could still be helpful. It can prevent mutations that infect more humans. There might be an opportunity for these viruses to exchange genetic material. But the best advice, stay away from sick birds. I try to stay away from wildlife, just respect their environments and um, keep a distance. I'm also like terrified of birds, so <laughs> by default I keep my distance regardless. Health officials are urging people to report any dead wildlife that they do find or see. And Yvette, you mentioned there's no vaccine for avian flu, but there, there is more advice on how we can protect ourselves. Well, that's right, Ian. And, you know, health officials are emphasizing that it's never a good idea to handle wildlife or dead wildlife. And if you ever do touch something like that, you're urged to scrub your hand. And to keep in mind that this is spread through migratory wild birds, fowl like uh, Canadian geese mostly, but it can also spread through mammals like cats or, or cows. So to keep your pets away from dead wildlife as well. Yvette Brand reporting from Vancouver tonight. On the other side of the country, a new warning tonight from public health officials about measles. New Brunswick reporting 11 new cases this weekend, all in the Fredericton and St. John River Valley area. Since October, the province has had 25 cases. Health officials are urging those who have never been infected to get vaccinated, especially those born after 1970. Tonight, some 1,200 dock workers at the Port of Montreal are now locked out, rejecting a proposed deal just hours ago. They join workers at the Port of Vancouver who have been locked out since early last week. Vanessa Lee shows us the impact of work stoppages at Canada's two busiest shipping ports. Yeah, we can only make as many water filters as we have glass tanks. This BC water filtration company is at a near standstill until it receives its next shipment. Santa Via relies on glass tanks imported from China. This coming week, we won't have any 
inventory to be able to manufacture. It's one of many Canadian businesses anxiously waiting for containers at the Port of Vancouver to start moving again. And we're a very small business. We're 25 staff only. Um, and so this has a pretty large financial impact for us. We're losing ten to $15,000 a day in lost sales. Talks between the BC Maritime Employers Association and the union representing 700 locked out foremen restarted Saturday with the help of federal mediators, but they were short-lived. The dispute is holding up $800 million worth of goods every day at Canada's largest port. On the heels of rail strikes, it's the latest in a long line of labour disputes the Canadian Chamber of Commerce says has hurt the country's economy and international reputation. Unfortunately, this growing trend of labour disruptions is advertising that supply chain issues are something of a way of life here, especially over the last couple of years. And this puts contracts for Canadian businesses at risk. And there may soon be even more backlogs. Port of Montreal workers are also locked out after rejecting the latest offer. The union says schedules and work-life balance are at the heart of the impasse, adding the two sides have not been at the bargaining table since the end of September. The port moves nearly 400 million in cargo daily. Bulk grain exports aren't affected. On top of the uncertainty at the country's busiest ports, Canadians face another potential stoppage, a looming strike at Canada Post. The Retail Council of Canada says businesses are bracing for what they're calling an unprecedented triple threat labour disruption just ahead of the busy holiday season. Vanessa Lee, CBC News, Montreal. Donald Trump and Joe Biden will have a meeting at the White House on Wednesday as the president-elect prepares to take power next year. And as Katie Simpson shows us, he's also narrowing down who will join his inner circle. President Joe Biden spending the weekend away from the White House as he prepares to leave it for good. Mr. President, come talk to us. Committing to a peaceful transfer of power, he'll sit down with his successor this week. And then they will go through the top issues, both domestic and foreign policy issues. And the president will have the chance to explain to President Trump how he sees things. Nice to be with you. On Russia, Donald Trump reportedly telling President Vladimir Putin not to escalate the war in Ukraine during a call Thursday just now being disclosed. The Republican Party is divided over the war, as some lawmakers have advocated against U.S. support for Ukraine. The American people want sovereignty protected here in America before we spend our funds and resources protecting the sovereignty of another nation. Trump himself campaigned on ending the conflict within 24 hours of taking office. Uh, I believe I will be able to make a deal between President Putin and President Zelensky. Trump is now finalizing his inner circle, cutting out prominent Republicans who've criticized him in the past, writing on his social media platform, I will not be inviting former Ambassador Nikki Haley or former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to join the Trump administration. With his clear win, including a sweep of all seven swing states, Trump is looking to make good on his pledges to voters. They have given President Trump a resounding mandate to deliver on the promises that he made on the campaign trail. The American right. people are done with these far progressive policies. They want common sense. Trump's spokesperson says there will be multiple executive orders ready to go the day he takes office, most related to immigration and security at the southern U.S. border. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. There are fresh warnings tonight for Canada from a former member of Donald Trump's cabinet. Wilbur Ross says Trump may do more than slap tariffs on Canadian exports. J.P. Tasker looks at which industries could be targets and how Ottawa is preparing. As Canada braces for a trade battle with the next U.S. administration, a fresh warning from Donald Trump's last Commerce Secretary. He's going to be cracking down even more than last time on the abuses of trade by various countries. That's going to be a real fact. Wilbur Ross slapped tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum in Trump's first term. We would like to have our trading partners also practice free trade. Now he's warning Canada's supply-managed farm sectors like dairy and eggs could be in for a rude awakening with Trump 2.0. The U.S. wants more access to the Canadian market, something Trump didn't get in his first term. Supply management is a very hot topic 
I think you're going to see him going back to where we were and probably in some cases uh, going beyond. Ross says one sector could be spared, Canadian energy. I can't imagine that the president would want to tax that. My favorite word. Tariff. Trump is also threatening to levy a minimum 10% tariff on all imports. While the president-elect is known to exaggerate, just the threat of trade action could be a problem for Canadian businesses. Investors start leaving Canada, production starts shifting elsewhere. Even if we get back to status quo, it's not all's well that ends well. Canada's really going to take a hit. Prime Minister Trudeau's point person on the U.S. says Canada is ready for whatever comes its way. The team in place has the experience and the expertise and the relationships uh, to make sure that we can promote Canada and defend our interests. Canada's ambassador to the U.S. insists Trump and Trudeau get along well. That goodwill could help smooth over some of the irritants, she says. I think that they have a good, warm and very effective relationship. Still, Trudeau has just revived his cabinet committee on Canada-U.S. relations. It's a sign the relative stability of the last four years is officially over. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Voters in a Metro Vancouver riding will head to the polls next month in a federal by-election. Cloverdale, Langley City has swung between Liberals and Conservatives in the past two elections. The seat was left vacant after former Liberal MP John Aldeg resigned to run in B.C.'s provincial election, a race he lost. Police rounded up dozens of protesters in Amsterdam today who defied a ban on demonstrations put in place after Israeli soccer fans were chased and attacked after a game in the city last week. Protest organizers had sought a court injunction to allow the gathering, but they lost, and police moved in. That ban has now been extended until Thursday. French officials say more police will also be deployed for a France-Israel soccer match that day in Paris. Russia and Ukraine have each launched massive cross-border drone attacks, causing injuries and damage on the ground. Russia says it faced the largest Ukrainian attack on Moscow so far, shooting down 34 drones that were targeting the capital. Ukraine says Russia attacked with a record 145 drones, the dueling strikes after another month of Russian advances in Ukraine. Grueling and costly, according to the UK's top soldier. October was the worst casualty figures for Russia so far. On average, over 1,500 people either killed or wounded every single day. But there are reports Russia is massing a new force of 50,000 troops, including North Korean soldiers. Ukraine's army is struggling with shortages of manpower and ammunition. What are you planning to talk with him about? Joe Biden's upcoming meeting with Donald Trump is expected to address that. President Biden will make the case that we do need ongoing resources for Ukraine beyond the end of his term. The current $60 billion U.S. military aid package for Ukraine has almost run out. Toronto police are investigating an apparent brazen kidnapping of a top Canadian cryptocurrency CEO. He was allegedly pulled into a car at the heart of Toronto's downtown, held for ransom, then released shortly afterward. As Lisa Shing explains, it would be the latest kidnapping by criminals looking for a big crypto payoff. Rush hour at this intersection in the heart of downtown Toronto, an alleged kidnapping. I'm Dean Skirka, president and CEO at WonderFi. The victim, Dean Skirka, the wealthy CEO of WonderFi based in Toronto. The company calls itself the largest regulated crypto trading platform in Canada with more than a billion dollars in assets. Police say suspects forced him into a vehicle and demanded money. Skirka was taken 23 kilometers west to this park where he was dropped off more than an hour later. He was unharmed. According to a source close to the investigation, he was released after paying a ransom of $1 million. In an email to CBC News, Skirka confirmed he is safe and that all client funds and data remain safe and were not impacted by this incident. Harder for somebody to go to the bank and take out a million dollars. This digital forensics expert says this currency is attractive to criminals. Because it is easy to transfer that cryptocurrency to others and it's harder to trace. 
Kidnappings for ransoms paid in cryptocurrencies have happened before. Two years ago, attackers tortured social media entrepreneur Ferrin Denzel in his Spanish home, hoping to get tens of millions of dollars in Bitcoin. In Brazil, crypto company founder Rosello Lopez's wife was taken for the same reason. For platforms like ours, it's all about you know, embracing those trends. Skirka, taken the day the company released its third quarter earnings results, showing a 153% increase compared to the same time last year, the same day the price of Bitcoin hit a new high. The trend and the correlation seems to be pretty close to the exchange rate of Bitcoin. The vast majority of the attacks that we know about are successful. And lower risk, he says, because the targets tend to have lighter security. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Wind and solar power are getting a lot more attention as countries try to curb their carbon emissions. But as Paula Dehatchik explains, old, broken infrastructure creates a lot of waste and Canadian companies are looking for solutions. This panel is no longer useful. Inside this warehouse are thousands and thousands of old, busted up solar panels. I call it the big green elephant of renewable energy is the waste material. Dan Karochi has spent years installing renewable energy infrastructure. His new venture, figuring out how to dismantle and recycle it when it doesn't work anymore. Renewable energy is a new waste stream. We need to get future ready in order to manage that waste so it doesn't end up in landfills or orphaned. Some provinces are mulling how to bring these materials into their recycling systems, but coordinated programs and facilities are rare. That has some companies thinking about how to turn that trash into treasure. I think companies that are thinking about recycling now and thinking about what opportunity they can get from the reuse of the steel and the copper and the precious metals in these projects are really going to be in boom times in 20 years or so when, when these projects come to the end of their lifespan here. According to the University of Ottawa's Smart Prosperity Institute, by 2050, the country will be dealing with at least 365,000 tonnes of expired solar panel waste and 4.5 million tonnes of waste from wind turbines. And then what we're doing is we're creating other environmental problems while trying to address um, the climate problem. We need to move fast on climate, but we need to make sure we're not creating additional problems along the side of it. What you can see here is just a fraction of what we've collected from various projects. As for Dan Karochi, he's not waiting around. The underlying message that we've gotten from everybody is that it's too early for renewable energy waste recycling. But as you can see, it's definitely not too early. Like we are behind the times. We need to get future ready. He hopes to have a recycling facility up and running by the end of the year. Paula Duhacek, CBC News, Brooks, Alberta. Murray Sinclair has become the first Indigenous leader to be given a national commemorative ceremony. He was often the lone voice of dignity against a wall of callousness. How Sinclair is being remembered. Retracing the steps of an Indigenous man who fought for Canada in the First World War. I never dreamed I'd be able to actually walk where Sam walked. Why Belgium chose to honour Sam Glode. And a famous Banff bear takes a field trip. There's most likely something happening that's pretty special, and it was the boss. We're back in two. And a legend about to leave the game for the Thorns. Will Christine Sinclair have a chance to play again? And ultimately, that would be it for Christine Sinclair's professional career. Her club, the Portland Thorns, eliminated from the National Women's Soccer League playoffs. Sinclair finishes with three league titles, three Olympic medals, and is international football's all-time top scorer among women and men. In Winnipeg today, a national commemorative ceremony was held to honour Murray Sinclair, the trailblazing Anishinaabe judge who led Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Brittany Greenslade shows us heartfelt tributes to all that he achieved. Murray Sinclair was an Indigenous force, a celebrated elder, judge and senator who made history. My father's most enduring gift is that he loved this country and all of its complicatedness. Remembered by his son at this national commemorative ceremony in Winnipeg, 
the first ever held to honor an indigenous leader. That he was often the lone voice of dignity against a wall of callousness. Sinclair died on November 4th at age 73. Here he was celebrated, sometimes with laughter, often through tears. Tears of gratitude for such a, an amazing human being that was able to describe a complex situation with everyday down to earth, simple words. An Anishinaabe lawyer, Sinclair broke barriers. He was the first Indigenous judge in Manitoba. But he's best known for leading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, helping Canadians to confront the country's dark past. Murray has brought us together. He's brought our whole country together. Sinclair not only listened, he made sure survivors were heard. His leadership was not just about asking for the truth but demanding it. Many spoke of his strength and, and his compassion. When his kindness and his courage to speak out in that bubble in Ottawa where we work was so outstanding. The ceremony itself seen as proof of progress. We don't have a long history of Canada recognizing Indigenous greatness in its midst. His legacy and life's work now left up to Canadians to continue. Though we have lost our teacher, we have not lost his teachings. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Today, before the ceremony, Governor General Mary Simon sat down with CBC News and was asked how she'll remember Murray Sinclair. That he uh, was a very proud Indigenous man. He loved his family more than anything. And he loved Canada and Canadians. And that's what I remember about him. According to a statement from his family, Murray Sinclair was laid to rest on Thursday in accordance with his wishes. Belgium is shining a spotlight on an Indigenous soldier who fought for Canada in the First World War. It's beautiful, right? It's, it's emotional. His spirit's still here. The gesture that's helping people reconnect with their ancestors. Plus, are Donald Trump's legal troubles about to disappear? There's no scenario that I can imagine um, where these criminal cases proceed. And weighing the benefits of involuntary treatment. They essentially told me, you know, go to treatment or go to jail. It didn't work. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. In London, tens of thousands of people joined the remembrance ceremony to honor veterans and fallen soldiers. King Charles led the nation in observing two minutes of silence. The Princess of Wales was also on hand, one of her first official appearances following her cancer treatment. On the eve of Remembrance Day, the great-great-grandson of an indigenous soldier who fought for Canada in the First World War is retracing his steps. Kayla Housel was there as Belgium honored the sacrifice of indigenous veterans. This is a memorial recognizing Canadians who fought during the First World War. But on this day, the focus is on just one man. I pray, Creator, that you stay with our friend Jeff as he takes us on the journey of his ancestors. Jeff Purdy is retracing the steps of his great-great-grandfather, Sam Glode, a Mi'kmaq soldier from Nova Scotia. I've always wanted to come here to Belgium and come around and walk around, but I never dream that I'd be able to actually walk where Sam walked. Belgium is honoring Canada's Indigenous veterans this Remembrance Day. It just gives you a deeper appreciation of um, reconciliation. We are here. Erwin Uriel is a battlefield tour guide in Flanders Fields. Yes, where the poppies blow between the crosses row on row. This is very short, that's why... He's researched Sam Glode's story. My interest was anyway in, in minority groups in the Great War uh, who were then often forgotten. The German line was running in front of Messine. Glode fought in the Battle of Messine. The biggest mine battle in history. So we're now entering the, the dugout. This is... He was a member of the first Canadian tunneling company, digging dugouts for protection, 
This is a reconstructed one in the center of Zonnebeke, where the company of St. Groot was digging only 200 meters away. And planting explosives deep beneath German lines, this crater left behind by one of them. We still have his, his uh, World War I helmet. Glode was one of the lucky ones. He made it home and died in Nova Scotia at the age of 79. But those who didn't, members of his company, are buried here. The friendships in, in, that he created, yeah, so his, his spirit's still here. Glode was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for bravery. These Canadians, grateful for Belgium's efforts. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? It's, it's emotional. But it's, I'm, I'm one of one family, and, and it's very honoring. Around 4,000 Indigenous people from Canada served in the First World War. Now one more is receiving the recognition he deserves. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Ypres, Belgium. And CBC News has special coverage on Remembrance Day from the National War Memorial. Join Rosemary Barton right here at 10 a.m. Eastern or stream it anywhere you get CBC News. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. As Canada grapples with a drug crisis, a debate over forced treatment. Is it better to have involuntary care or to allow somebody to languish in a tent shooting fentanyl in their neck? But first... Donald Trump's victory in Arizona means a clean sweep of all seven swing states. I'm just so excited that we can finally make America great again. I'm thinking, you know, who's to blame? And with some anxious about the future, Canadian-American journalist Ali Velchi points to the work ahead. There is neither time nor space for cynicism about politics today. Someone who understands the political divide. And Ali Velchi joins us from New York. Great to have you on the show. Good to be back with you, Ian. Uh, was there any point, whether it was election night or, or even as late as last night when the results for Arizona were finally confirmed, any point where you were surprised at how well Trump did? Yeah, I mean, look, the trend has just been reinforcing it all itself all week with the win of, in Arizona. It means that he swept all seven of the of the swing states. Uh, yeah, it was surprising. It was surprising in, in the fact that the results uh, came in so early. We really expected this to be many, many days of reporting on this election. Look, this was an underperformance by, by Kamala Harris and the Democrats. We are probably, it's a little too early to tell exactly why, but there are a lot of things at play here. One of the things that Democrats really counted on was the idea that women would come out in big numbers because of the abortion bans across this country. Well, there were 10 referendums across the country. Seven of them were won by uh, groups who supported keeping reproductive rights available to everyone. One was defeated in Florida, but it was defeated with 57% of the vote. It just at the threshold was 60 for that to pass. So the problem is that women did come out to support their own reproductive rights, and some still voted for Donald Trump, uh, who many say are resp is responsible for packing the Supreme Court in a way that Roe v. Wade fell. So that we had seen that for a few years, that abortion rights were a motivating uh, factor for voters. What we didn't calculate was that they would be a motivating factor for voters who wanted to protect their abortion rights, but they were not able to distinguish that from voting for Donald Trump. So overperformance by Donald Trump, underperformance by the Democrats and Kamala Harris for reasons you know, that we're going to be studying for several months. Yeah, there's so many different demographics to look at. Let me ask you about Latinos. Uh, Trump used such ugly language to talk about migrants now he would describe them as illegal migrants but still the rhetoric was was quite coarse and, and negative and yet he did really well with a lot of yeah. latino voters how did that happen yeah that that jump is quite something i mean donald trump had been polling and certainly in prior elections had been forming in the high to mid mid to high 20 percent range amongst hispanics and latinos and that that shot way up uh, for a lot of reasons uh, part of it is that that is a mature community in the united states and we see this with all mature communities obviously in most of the united states hispanic and latino communities are our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of immigrants is obviously a very large um, native-born population but as we see with these communities mature their, their, their priorities shift away from immigration and, and, and social issues into economic issues. And when you look at it through that lens, what you see in the United States is something we've seen all over the world, and that is post-pandemic uh, incumbent governments 
are being saddled with this general frustration about inflation and the economy. Uh, and that is not something, despite the strength of the economy in the United States, despite the fact that it's got lower inflation than most of the developed world, despite the fact that it leads the world in growth and stock market performance, the, the inflation aspect of things really sticks. And that really stuck for a lot of people. But, you know, in every way, Donald Trump made gains in, in so many demographics. So it becomes hard to tell which one was determinant versus, you know, which ones were incidental. We have about 90 seconds left. And, and let me ask you this. You did a, a really nice essay on MSNBC about how emotional a lot of people in the states are feeling. Yours was directed sure. towards those who supported the Democrats and lost Thanksgiving is coming up. It's a time in the United States where a lot of families gather. Given this deep political divide and the raw emotions, what do you think Thanksgiving is going to be like in America? Well, I think it's going to be tough. I think there are a lot of people who've lost friends who, uh, in the course of the last few years, both because of this and, and other global political issues that are going on, I, I think that Americans are, are going to face a reckoning. They're going to have to figure out if half the country, you know, we are truly divided in a way that once led to a civil war and and as we were during the the civil rights movement in the united states this is a truly divided country and we're going to have to figure out how we move forward within that construct because you can't kind of hate everybody on the other side but this polarization has really hit a place and it's affecting people and that's kind of why i did that essay i sort of said look we're we don't know where we are in the fight for preservation of democracy and and for all the things that america can be i have no idea whether we're in in, in late innings or we're in the middle of this whole thing and we just need to think about it that way. But this is a tough time for a lot of Americans. Nobody, you, you might be happy if you supported Donald Trump and he won, but there's nobody who thinks that American politics is just right right now and that people are talking to each other in the right way. In that, though, Ian, we reflect a lot of the world. Perhaps we lead a lot of the world in that particular problem, but it is a global phenomenon. Ali, as I said, really nice to have you on the show. I hope your family in Ontario is watching, and uh, let's talk again. Thanks, my friend. Despite Donald Trump's win, he still faces a number of criminal and civil cases. Anya Zolajowski examines what could happen now that Trump is headed back to the White House. It's a first. A convicted felon elected president of the United States. This will truly be the golden age of America. That's what we have to Donald Trump is awaiting sentencing in New York in a hush money case involving adult film star Stormy Daniels and still facing three other criminal cases and multiple civil cases. But what happens now that he's president-elect? Legal experts say Trump's team will double down on their fight to get all cases dropped or delayed. The reality is that the criminal cases are going to go away. There's no scenario that I can imagine um, where these criminal cases proceed. During the campaign, Trump vowed to get rid of special counsel Jack Smith. It's so easy. I would fire him within two seconds. Smith is in charge of two ongoing federal cases against Trump. One accusing Trump of mishandling classified documents and the other for trying to overturn the 2020 election results. He has pledged basically to kind of use the Department of Justice as basically a tool of um, punishing his uh, enemies and rewarding his friends. Trump has also been indicted in Georgia for alleged election interference in 2020. He has, certainly has more influence in the federal cases. Now, now, he doesn't have that much influence in the state cases other than uh, for the Justice Department to go in and, and move to have those state cases stayed. Trump is facing several civil cases, too, including for his role in the January 6th riot and for inflating his net worth to defraud financial institutions. He lost that fraud case and is now appealing. Experts say that Trump will have less influence over civil cases, but his team may argue that they would interfere with his duties as president. I think there would be some question about how much of a burden would the litigation place on the president? And if it was an undue burden, would that be a reason for essentially staying the litigation for the pendency of the presidency? And no one knows what will happen next because everything about this is unprecedented. Nobody has stressed the Constitution historically in the presidency the way Trump has. I mean, almost everything he does raises a serious constitutional issue. A New York judge is expected to decide this week whether Trump's hush money conviction will stand, given the Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. That decision may also affect Trump's sentencing hearing, which is set for November 26th. 
Calls for involuntary treatment to tackle drug addiction are gaining traction, but some care providers are skeptical. I think it's absurd that we're talking about forced treatment because people who want care can't access it. A closer look at the heated debate is next. There is a growing number of politicians proposing forced treatment for those struggling with addiction. And some say it can't come soon enough. She's a slave to the addiction. And since she can't choose recovery, I think it's our responsibility to do that for her. But others question whether it will work. The scientific evidence to support this as an approach, as an effective approach, just simply isn't there. Mike Crawley shows us both sides of an intense debate over controversial policy to address Canada's addiction crisis. Widespread drug use in public places. He's around oh. yeah. The growth of homeless encampments. Fears of the potential for crime. It's all got many Canadians looking for solutions to the drug crisis. Some are wondering, is forcing people into treatment the way to go? The answer to addiction and public safety is not more drugs or ignorance or looking the other way. There are individuals who are on the verge of a fatality that desperately need treatment. So the idea is gaining political traction in Canada, but does forced treatment actually work? Well, the evidence is far from clear. For some people, it feels like their only hope. It's what Luana Laurison desperately wants for her daughter. I don't want to lose her. And I don't want to lose her and her become a statistic. Laurison's adopted daughter, Elithle, is 22. She has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and got addicted to drugs in high school. I think if something like involuntary care had been in place six years ago, my daughter wouldn't be where she is right now. She wouldn't be emaciated. She wouldn't have been assaulted. She wouldn't have burns on her body. Laurison often has no idea where her daughter is. She's a slave to the addiction. That's what's running her life now. She has repeatedly written to BC's Premier, begging for a way to force Alethle into treatment. There are only two outcomes for my daughter that I can see. Recovery or death. And since she can't choose recovery, I think it's our responsibility to do that for her. Right now, under provincial mental health acts, someone can be forced into psychiatric treatment if a doctor deems them a danger to themselves or others. Under the criminal code, the courts cannot force anyone into drug treatment, but can offer it as an alternative to jail. Here in Alberta, the government is promising legislation to allow for involuntary treatment. It's also creating 10,000 new detox and addiction recovery spaces the biggest expansion in North America. What's happening in Alberta is being looked at around the planet. Marshall Smith is a key architect of Alberta's plan. Everything about the Alberta model is really geared towards getting people off of drugs. He was chief of staff to Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, no relation. 20 years ago, he was addicted to methamphetamines. I gave up my suit and tie at the legislature in British Columbia where I worked at the time and vanished into the downtown east side of Vancouver where I lived as a, as a homeless addict for about four or four and a half years. Smith traces his own recovery to an ultimatum he got from the police. They essentially told me, you know, go to treatment or go to jail. I picked treatment uh, and I haven't looked back since. The Alberta government plans legislation to pave the way for forcing people into treatment without a criminal conviction, something Smith supports. Is it better to have involuntary care or to allow somebody to languish in a tent shooting fentanyl in their neck under an overpass with the threat of dying? I would say it's more effective than that any day of the week. But what does the research actually say about the effectiveness of forcing people into treatment? Just last year, a task force of Canadian addiction medicine specialists reviewed 42 studies from around the globe. 
The report found a lack of high quality evidence to support or refute involuntary treatment. The scientific evidence to support this as an approach, as an effective approach, just simply isn't there. The comment I heard most often from experts about forcing people into treatment, well, they said governments must first make sure there's enough treatment available for those who actually want it. Dr. Katie Dorman has worked in the addictions field for much of her career. For years, I saw that people died waiting for treatment. Residential treatment is very difficult to access. There are so many barriers and people could be waiting three to six months. They can be waiting 12 months for, for a program that's appropriate and safe for them. When you hear politicians talking about forcing people into involuntary treatment, what comes to your mind? I mean, I think it's absurd that we're talking about forced treatment because people who want care can't access it. Here on the front lines of the drug crisis, forcing people into treatment is not on the agenda. We want to build trust. Trust is huge. Our clients are quite marginalized and they've come from traumatic and hard lives. And trust is key to start with in building these relationships. In Hamilton, Ontario, the police lead a team that includes social workers and addiction specialists. Is there anything else that you're kind of looking for in terms of support from our team? I want people to An approach the team members say better reflects the realities of drug addiction. I want people to understand that these are human beings that have come from traumatic and hard lives and you need to meet them where they're at. When you're ready for that treatment and you want that treatment, it's much more successful than forcing it on someone. <laughs> there it is. That's a view shared by Emily Ranf. Okay, I can help you find the other ones too. A decade ago, when she was living on the streets of Kingston, Ontario, Ranf was involuntarily hospitalized several times. Getting bad when I was 19 years old with mental health issues and as well as substance use. My whole life wrapped around using substances and I was making a lot of unsafe decisions. Her perspective on being forced into treatment? It didn't work. It just made me, me and my parents, I strained our relationship even more. Yes. I'm old. Okay, okay. What Rant okay. says actually made the difference for her okay. and spurred her to get clean learning that she was pregnant with her son, Cedar, who's now four. It was the catalyst to my change and that I had to make that either I continue on in this way or I ha have to choose to live again, really. It was choosing to live. If you force treatment, but everything stays the same, uh, that's not gonna help people. As the debate over involuntary treatment goes on, the drug crisis continues to ravage communities across Canada it's toll on people like Luana Laurison. I feel helpless and sometimes I feel like giving up. Despite that feeling, she keeps going with her quest to get help for her daughter. She may get what she's looking for. BC's Premier David Eby recently promised legislation on forced addiction treatment for people who, in his words, are unable to seek it themselves. Ian? And Mike, you also mentioned Alberta. Could it become a reality anywhere else in Canada? Well, just this week in Ontario, the mayors of nearly 30 cities called on Doug Ford's government to start exploring the idea. But keep in mind, whatever province puts forward legislation, it'll almost certainly face a court challenge over whether forcing someone into treatment violates their charter rights. Mike Crawley in our Toronto studio tonight. Coming up, Banff's most famous bear goes on a little excursion. Most likely something happening that's pretty special, and it was the boss. Why the boss went for a wander is next in our moment. This bear is a bit of a celebrity in Alberta. They call him the boss, and he's the most dominant grizzly in Banff National Park. Recently, the boss went on an excursion, deciding to grab a snack along the way. And tonight, that trip makes our moment. And there was a very kind of big deal going on with Parks Canada and Banff. So you know there's most likely something happening that's pretty special, and it was the boss. The majority of the boss's time is spent west of Banff. For him to come over to Canmore, that's an unusual travel for him. 
5th, after visiting the town on Sunday evening, he started heading back towards Banff National Park, which is his home turf. And he stopped by a yard where he had got a food reward the previous day. Obviously, once a bear finds a, a spot, they will return to it. I've been a nature photographer for over 20 years and probably over the last 12 years, I've had a dozen or more encounters with them. Parks Canada shared with me as he's getting older, he's taking a few more chances. You know, he's maybe finding it a little bit harder to find food on the landscape. Parks Canada just did a phenomenal job of, of keeping this fella safe and getting him back to his home turf. Despite the lighthearted music and uh, sort of happy tone of the photographer, make no mistake, this is a big, potentially dangerous bear. It's been in the news a couple of times. One time, uh, some hikers saw it eating a, a black bear. It was uh, five times the size, they said, of the black bear that it presumably had killed. Another time, it got hit by a train, still used the, the tracks to kind of migrate within Banff National Park, but experts say it's likely learned to stay out of the way of trains. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. Good night.